This is a sentencing in the Linaway County Circuit Court for Justin James Gibson, who's now 38 years old. But back in December of 2000, he was 16 years old. And he pled guilty to second degree murder of his grandmother back on November 8th at the time he was 15 years old. So a 15 year old is accused of, well, is convicted of shooting his grandmother in the back of the head with the family owned 22 caliber rifle. He then left her body in a raised bucket of the front end loader on a rural Rollin Township property just west of the town of Adrian. Police said he had by the time dug her a grave, a hole big enough for two people. His grandfather was absolutely devastated by the loss of his wife and demanded that the youth be put in prison for the rest of his life. Mr. Gibson said little at the during the sentencing and hung his head low to avoid the tearful gazes of his family. Only when asked by the judge whether he had anything to say, he spoke and said, there's nothing I can do to change what I've done. He cried and said, I'm sorry, I can't change it. His motive was thought to be money for drugs. This is in the matter of the people of the state of Michigan versus Justin James Gibson, file number 2000-9028FC. I have Jennifer Bruggeman appearing on behalf of Illinois County Prosecutor's Office, and I have Tamara Sennigan appearing on behalf of Mr. Gibson. This is the time scheduled for a resentencing under some recent changes in the law. And um, I want to commend both counsel for very in-depth briefs and responses, and I appreciate that. So, Ms. Hennigan, are you ready to proceed? We are, Your Honor. All right. And Ms. Hennigan, I did not receive um, where they updated the entire pre-sentence report, but I did receive a pre-sentence case report updating the information. Did you receive that? I did, Your Honor. Have you received everything you need to proceed today? I have. Ms. Bregman, have you as well? Yes, ma'am. All right. And um, so um, it's not a typical sentence because I assume there's going to be argument on um, the information contained in the briefs, correct? Yes, ma'am. All right. So, Ms. Hennigan, before we, I guess, um, I guess before we proceed, do you want to address your brief? and what you want the court to consider today. Yes, Your Honor, thank you. I'm trying to find an average height. Excuse me. <laughs> it was Rhonda. No. But Your Honor, I'm going to be very brief in, in addressing the objections that we made um, to the pre-sentence report and the recent objections that we made. Um, they're based from our position solely on what we believe that uh, the Miller factors require to be considered. And so um, in going through the one page um, pre-sentence case report that we received, the updated or revised one, we felt that they used, uh, the state used the abbreviated um, Miller factors while the actual Miller factors do go into more depth and require um, that more things be considered. So we, um, we know that this court reads our documents. We know that this court has reviewed those documents. Um, and I'm not going to belabor that with going through all of those, just acknowledging that um, there were errors as to Justin's age at the time of the crime. He was 15 and not 16. And we do feel that that is the only thing that was addressed with regard to his, um, his age and immaturity, impetuousness, et cetera, that are required by Miller. And we thoroughly laid out our position on that. Um, we also noted that they um, abbreviated factors. They used factors three and four, whereas those should be just factor three. And so we've combined those together and, and responded to any inaccuracies um, that were there. A very important note to us is that it was noted that Justin was never abused in his home. And since the time of this crime, um, as I noted, that was 23 years ago. People didn't talk about the abuse in their home 23 years ago. But since that time, uh, Justin and his mother, his siblings have all come forward and had a, they've had time to heal, time to go to counseling, and they speak very freely about the abuse that did occur in that home and had um, 
had any of them been reached out to, it's certain that they would have shared that information with MDOC as well. Um, but you saw that there are letters of support there stating what they felt about the abuse that took place in the home back then and how that impacted uh, Justin's life and, and their lives. Um, in addition, we did not note that the um, pre-sentence case report addressed factors four and five at all of the Miller factors, one of those being uh, simply whether or not um, had Justin been an adult and been more mature, could he have helped with maybe negotiating a lesser charge or a lesser sentence? They didn't address that, but we didn't. We do not assert to this court that that would have changed anything in Justin's particular case. And then factor five being that um, the possibility of rehabilitation, and that was not addressed either. And so um, we have put in our objection and Justin's response um, that it's our position that not only is there a possibility for Justin to be rehabilitated, but that Justin has demonstrated um, that he has been rehabilitated um, through the things that he has done, not only taking advantage of everything that's been available to him as a, as a lifer, but also helping to create new programming um, and seeing the um, the deficiencies in the MDOC's current program and what life has had available. Justin has taken the initiative to help create new programming and, and continues to facilitate that, which has allowed him over his years there to continue to demonstrate his ability to be rehabilitated and um, how much he has actually succeeded with his rehabilitation. So I think that that's the, the main basis. And again, we would rely upon our, our brief that we've submitted in here. All right. Um, and did you want to address your response? I do, Your Honor. Um, a couple of things. Uh, with regard to the um, objections that were just filed this week on, on the updated PSA. Um, <clears throat> well, one, I would agree that the age needs to be changed to 15. At the time that he was sentenced, he was 16, but at the time of the offense, he was 15. So that does need to be changed. Um, also, the beginning sentence, two sentences in the updated uh, case report, um, that's inaccurate. That needs to be removed. Those bills, um, have to do with out, outlying life uh, without parole in general. Those are being proposed. That has nothing to do with this, this case. Um, this case came back to the court as it knows um, because of people of East Stovall. The case she's referring to is the people of East Stovall. And this was a case that went before the Michigan Supreme Court, and the court ultimately decided that a sentence of life in prison without the possibility of parole for a defendant who committed second-degree murder while a juvenile constitutes cruel and unusual punishment and therefore violates Constitution 1963, Article 1, Section 16. And they remanded it for resentencing. And because of that, any juvenile who was received a similar sentence is now up for the possibility of resentencing in the case, which is what Judge Anzalone is deciding right now. And um, and that Mr. Gibson was convicted of uh, secondary murder and given life with the possibility of parole, which has been determined to be um, unconstitutional. Uh, so this court is directed to give a term of your sentence. I'm not going to belabor all that, but again, those two sentences in the beginning need to be removed. Um, the only other thing I would say with regard to the updated report and the objections um a couple things the probation officer's duty under the law is captured in mcl 771.14 and the court rule 6.425 i know that the court asked asked probation to to address the miller factors but really the ultimate issue is whether the information is getting before the court that's what the case law says so Ms. Ms. Hennigan has done that. She has supplemented anything that they believe needs to be addressed to the court, given the information with regard to his, his institutional record, his rehabilitation as they see it. 
all those Miller factors have been addressed in one way, shape, or form, either through myself, through Ms. Hennigan, through the, through the probation court, or through probation. So as far as the content of it, an updated PSI, um, really the, the obligation there is, is to just make sure that, that the information is presented to you. So I don't believe that we need to belabor that point as far as um, what probation is required and not required to do. Um, and so with those corrections, um, the only other thing I would address would be the comment in the um, report that says he was not abused in the home. I could be wrong, but um, I believe that probably was referencing the grandparents' home. Yes. Um, that's how I interpreted it. And there really is no evidence that I've seen that Mr. Gibson was abused in the grandparents' home by the grandparents. Now, if we want to add in that, that word grandparents' home, um, I don't know if uh, defense would agree with that or if they still have other um, objection to that, but that's how I reviewed it. I do think that there is information in the record that does support that there was some um, mental and physical abuse by his stepfather and maybe also his father. Um, but again, uh, I think that that's in the record. Um, and uh, so I believe that's what I saw as far as any kind of quote unquote inaccuracies. Um, the only other thing I would say with regard to like the brief that was or the objections that was filed um there continues to be a, a claim about or not a claim but there's a difference in story um with regard to the offense itself and and the facts behind it and um all i would note is that i realize what mr gibson is saying now or has said in in certain instances but the agent's description of the offense at, and, and at the time of the original sentencing was never objected to, was never um, raised on appeal. There was no issue with, with that. And so I would ask this court to, to consider that as far as from the standpoint of in evaluating Mr. Gibson's accountability and the remorse that he shows for what happened in this instance. Um, I think I pretty much laid out, I, I had a lot to say, but at the same time, um, I think it is all laid out in my uh, original sentencing memorandum. I didn't respond to this one, one time wise, I didn't have time to. Um, really, I think as far as the snow and the Miller factors that this court needs to consider along with Mr. Gibson's youth, um, the court is required to take all those things into consideration and is required, which this just was clarified in a case that came down the other day, um, is required to, um, to uh, account for his youth as a mitigating factor. That's not an option, of course. So, it, and even though the case law is kind of all over the place as far as what the court's obligation is, as far as stating on the record how or how the court considered it, um, I would ask this court to 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 address that to the extent they can to to avoid any future issues about appeal wise and what have you, because. Um, it is a new thing. Obviously, this court has never done this before, um, and it's new in general in the state of Michigan. So I, I get the, the difficulty here. One, we're 20 some years from the original offense. It's difficult to do. It's almost, it's like looking hindsight at things. And so, um, <clears throat> lastly- Ms. Oh, Brown, you said a case just came down? Yeah, um, so it was Boykin, which oh, actually- not not just like this week came down. No, but Boykin, so it that came down a while ago, but um, at the same time, it was, it's been going all over the place. Right, the it's 510 Mish 171. Yeah. It's in your brief. So yeah, okay. I thought you meant there was like a new one. No, um, although I just, I'm trying to find where I had it. On page four. No, I'm, I just, um, 
Give me one moment, Your Honor. Okay, so yes, um, I think where where I was, um, why I wanted to mention it again was because there was a, a case, and I think it was an unpublished case that just came down that really hammered that that the defendant's youth must be treated as a mitigating factor, not just whether the defendant's age was a mitigating factor. And it seems like such a fine line, and I think that's what the court was saying, but really this court must, and so view it as a mitigating factor. And so I just wanted to note that. But um, lastly, I would just say, um, I know that the uh, sentencing guidelines calculate at 270 to 450. There has been no objection to those um, either at original sentencing or now. Um, the proposed um, sentence from probation is 450 to 900. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Gibson has has served 279 months um, and some change, uh, and they're asking for a downward deviation. Um, claiming that he is re rehabilitated. I wholeheartedly disagree with that. I believe that one, Mr. Gibson needs to be uh, supervised. He needs to be on parole at some point. I don't think he's he's shown uh, through his misconducts in prison, which the last one was in 2022, which is somewhat concerning because this has been going on before 2022 as far as coming back to court on this. He so that's concerning from an alcohol standpoint. The fact that uh, he had a misconduct for dangerous contraband. Um, I don't know the facts of all that, but it's concerning. The other thing is, is Mr. Gibson, I think, admittedly has been limited in the types of programming that he's been offered because he is a lifer. So that's a no fault of him. And he has taken advantage of, of various things. And there are a lot of people that support him. and which is great um, and I'm happy about that. Um, but we can't also forget what happened here. We have a victim, we have two, uh, Miss, Miss Myers obviously deceased. Um, Mr. Myers has since passed away and so he's not here to speak. And I don't know how he would feel today. All I know is how he felt at the original sentencing which was not to let Mr. Gibson out ever. And I would ask the court to take that that statement that he I reiterated in my brief, as well as it's in the sentencing record, um, take that into account. Uh, the other thing I would just say is that, um, again, the changing statements of, of what happened on the date of the incident, the, the accountability that seems to shift um, depending on who he's talking to or, or, or the purpose. And so while I, I'm not in his mind, obviously, I, but his psychological evaluation, which I know he has issues with as well, but that did raise some issue with remorse and accountability. And, and again, I have a hard time with the changing of the story and what happened. Um, so again, I would ask this court to, uh, I believe it's proportional and appropriate and reasonable for the offense and the offender here to uh, for his sentence to be the minimum sentence to be towards the higher end of the guidelines, um, no less than 360 months. I don't I don't feel he's ready and has shown to this court that he has been rehabilitated and I would ask the court to sentence on the high end of the guidelines. Thank you. So I just wanted to get a little bit of that argument on the record, and then I'm going to move to my normal sense of procedure at this point. And then you'll have another opportunity to speak. And I do believe we have someone representing the victim's family as well as the same family as the defendant today. So, Mr. Could, Gibson. Your Honor, I'm sorry, could I just address you, the changes that Miss? You will. I'll give you okay, a chance. Thank you. So, Mr. Gibson, um, you've um, had an opportunity to read all the pleadings in this case. Yes, and you've had wait, this will stand for me because we just did better record. Because there's a microphone. So all right. So you've had an opportunity to read all the pleadings. Yes, ma'am. And you've been able to meet with your attorney as needed. Yes, ma'am. And you have an opportunity to discuss everything involved in this sentencing. 
Yes, ma'am. And you've had an opportunity to review the pre-sentence case report that was provided by Mr. Moore as an update? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Are you satisfied with Ms. Hennigan as your attorney and the advice that she has given you? I am. So, Ms. Hennigan, um, do you wish, other than what you mentioned and what Ms. Bregman mentioned, do you wish to explain or challenge the accuracy or relevancy of any information in this updated pre-sentence case report? Uh, Your Honor, I would just, first of all, I, I would just thank Ms. Bergerman for being so gracious this morning um, as opposing counsel. Um, we're grateful that she agrees on the age change. I have no objection to the removal of the first two sentences that she has requested the removal of. Um, we have no objection to the court um, Meaning the, the phrase in the home as the grandparents' home. Um, to be honest, we had not thought of it in that way, but we do see Ms. Bergman's point. And, um, and my client would state for the court that he was never abused in his grandparents' home. Um, only uh, The only thing we would ask the court to consider is that he was only in that home for a few months before this incident. And that uh, factor two state is, is focused on the family and home environment. So it does extend further than that. But by all means, he never intended to, to say that his grandparents abused him. Um, and and then, Mr. Moore will make that change, adding grandparents. Yes. To um, be more home, okay? And then um, we are aware that there are some differences in the story over time. Um, and I, I guess that triggered for me to say perhaps Miller Factor 4 would have made a difference if um, Justin wasn't so young. I don't know exactly how he dealt with the police at that time, but what I can say is that when we go back years in the um, the MDOC reports, his story has been consistent with them for years. And um, and I would say that we made a huge effort within our objections to the court to be very transparent about the gruesomeness of this crime. And, and in my opinion, our position is worse than what the MDOC um, has has stated in, in their story of her of her being shot in the back of the head. And Justin's been very transparent to me to tell me that he stood facing her and this happened. And, and we we put that in our objections because we are in no way trying to minimize um, the seriousness and heinousness of the crime that occurred. Um, and other than that, um, the misconduct in 2022, we did address that as well. That was um, alcohol related and um, Justin's dealt with grief over the loss of many um, inmates and family members who passed away from COVID. And I don't think any of us knew how to deal with the pandemic. We've never done it before in our lives. So not an excuse, but definitely that impacted him. And just to clarify with regard to the um, dangerous contra contraband, that was what, what the issue was. That, that was a, a stinger that's used to heat up water. Um, so just, he just wanted that to be placed on the record that that's what the dangerous contraband was. And that would be all with regard to uh, the report. Um, other than a juvenile record because of his age, he had no prior um, adult record um, and the probation department had calculated the guidelines to be 270 to 450 months. You agree with that calculation? Yes, sir, we do. All right. So if you could have a seat, I do believe we have someone to speak. Is there someone yes. who's going to speak today? <laughs> I don't know that's going to stand by. Okay. So, are we all speaking or are we just I'm just speaking. one speaker? She's okay. Just my mom and my sister. Okay. So, can you state your name for the record? Betty Ellis. And what is your relationship to Mr. Gibson? He's my brother. Okay. And is that his mother as well? Yes. Okay. And you are? Heather Jessup. And you're? His oldest sister. Got it. All right. So, you have a statement you'd like to make? Yes, I would. Um, so, we are speaking on behalf of the victims. Um, I would like to start off by saying that I'm about to read, what I'm about to read is not just my words. These are combined words coming from Justin's family. I will cry if you touch me. <laughs> coming from Justin's family who love and are here to support in his release. This includes my sisters, Heather Gibson and Elizabeth Doucette, who had prior obligations, so she couldn't be here today. Um, as well as our mother, Cindy Doucette. We were asked to speak about what we lost in grandma's death and about Justin. I would like to start off with, we feel we have lost 
what we feel we have lost in all of this, but I also want to say that we have, while we have lost so much, I will speak about what we have gained because we do not dwell in loss in this family. I will start with family. We became the black sheep of the family after Justin's fatal mistake. Grandma was what I called the glue of our extended family. Growing up, we had holidays with our aunts, uncles, and cousins, and we're close, but after everything that changed, family walked away from us. We were in a sense, in my feelings, considered the outcasts. The sense of family in that aspect was ripped from our childhood, and that is not an easy thing to deal with. Our mom lost so much when the family members turned on us, pointed fingers, made blame where there was none to be had. When you're this young, it's difficult to comprehend and understand to have so much taken from you in an instant. We didn't just lose a grandma and an extended family that day, we also lost a brother. Justin and Heather had a special bond with everything they went through as kids. Justin and Elizabeth had a beautiful bond, he adored her. I struggled the most with Justin. We butted heads and fought often due to our personalities clashing. This is obviously not the case today. Justin and Heather's dad was an alcoholic and basically estranged in their lives. And Elizabeth and I's father was in no way a model citizen. He was a drug addict, abusive, and manipulative physically and mentally. Justin grew up with a sense of abandonment, in my opinion, with a lack of examples of what a man should grow into and learned at a crucial age to deal with their feelings in the wrong manner. As Heather has told me, they were taught to be afraid of their feelings and in turn, it taught them to bottle them up so when they came out and presented in anger. None of us are excusing Justin's behavior. We are simply saying that he has been through a lot at a young age and so have we. We grew up in a small town. When you live in a small town, everyone knows everything. The looks and the judgments and going to school with everyone treating you like you were going to go off at any moment is hard for children to face. Our mother had to be judged for what her son did when she did the best she could in the circumstances that were dealt with life. As an example, I had a teacher who thought discussing the death penalty in class was a good topic of discussion. The conversation became very heated among the kids, and I became extremely upset knowing my brother was sitting in prison and confused about whether I thought he should die. I was still angry, sad, and lost. How could I sit there and wish death upon him? But also, how could I not with everything that was taken from me? I left the room crying, and for months, I was looked at strangely and treated differently because I was judged. And people were worried that maybe I would do something unfortunate in some shape or form. We, as Justin's sisters, lost family, lost friends, lost the innocence of childhood. Mom lost a mother and a son all in the same moment. We are victims of this as well as others, but we also gained from such an unfortunate life event. Mom is a wonderful mother. She would give and do anything for her children. Us girls are all successful, driven. We work hard, raise our families, and are always there for each other in times of need. We have healed, we have learned to grow into better people and focus on what matters in life. There is so much strength and unity in this family that has come out of all of this. As much as the pain was terrible, I don't feel if I had a choice, I would go back and change anything because I love my life now. I love who I've become and all my siblings. Now to speak about Justin personally. As I stated previously, he was lost for many reasons. When I think back, I remember the angry young boy who was getting in trouble, but was unable to be helped. Mom did what she could with the resources she had, but like many children in this world, there weren't the right resources available to help him properly, which led to a tragic situation. I look at Justin now and I see a strong, resilient, kind man who is doing his best to make amends for what he has done. Justin could have gone to prison, distanced himself and basically gave up, but he didn't. He took his punishment. He has helped others to the best of his ability and wants to continue to help others. He has fostered beautiful relationships with his family, old friends, and has built new relationships. A broken person doesn't do this. An unchanged person does not do this. We all understand that the purpose of this court hearing is to discuss the tragedy of him taking our grandmother's life. But it is also to focus on the fact that there is a difference between a boy and a man. We do not dwell on the past, we focus on the present and beauty. I would like to focus on everything he has managed to achieve while in prison. 
He has put his heart and his soul in, into everything he does to try and better himself and try to put his truth out there so that others do not make the same mistake. He has gone through every program that he was allowed to in order to heal. That is not something a person does if there is not true growth and remorse for past action. He pours his soul into his art and writings, into programs he has worked in, which include rehabilitating dogs and helping other inmates if he can. He calls us to learn about us and what is going on in our lives, his nieces and nephews, and to be as involved as he can. I went through a very ugly divorce with my oldest daughter's dad, and that was such a hard time in my life. I can honestly say that I looked forward to his phone calls because he helped me. He helped me process my feelings, support my decisions, and was simply there for me. There are people in this world that can't even accomplish that in person, and he was able to do it through a telephone. The man he is now is not the boy that made the tragic decision. We asked the court to let Justin come home to allow us to be a family again. No matter the outcome, we will continue to be there for Justin and love him for the man he is today. But if he continues to stay in prison, it is not just him that is being punished. After 23 years in prison, he has missed out on so much and so has our family. Mom's getting closer to retirement and I feel she should have time with her son that doesn't include sitting in a room for a few hours with others watching. It should be going out to meals, spending holidays as a family and just enjoying the small things that life has to offer. Heather and I both have children and we see someone who can guide and support our kids to not make the same mistakes. A brother and an uncle who can relate to all of us on a level that I'm sure others can't understand. Someone who might be able to help a child who is not able to understand how to manage their feelings and to be able to provide guidance. We all have put in time to heal and grow, but it's impossible to truly move on if we can continue to have to go through the prison system to spend time with or talk to Justin. We are ready for him to come home now. He has a full support system ready and willing to be there for him. And we ask the court to let us truly put this behind us as a family. Thank you. All right, and the record should also reflect that I did read and review all the individual letters that were attached to the pleadings. Can you read, you read them as well as part of it, correct? Um, yes, yes. To, yes, thank you. All right, thank you. All right, so. Ms. Bergman, anything else on behalf of the people? No, you know, Mary, um, it's a difficult case, and that's uh, in your discussion. Thank you, Miss Hennigan. Anything else you wanted to add in response and with regard to um, what you'd like to say on behalf of your client, and then I'll give him an opportunity to speak. Um, do, you, do we want to take a... No, we're good. We're going to do this. <laughs> okay. um, hi. I agree with Ms. Brigerman. Uh, to date, this has been the most difficult case I've, I've dealt with. Um, we want to thank, thank Justin's family as, as the victims of this crime that they have been able to... Um, speak what they need to say as victims, but also acknowledge who he has become. Um, so today, Your Honor, we're asking that the court and the community take a page from their book, um, their book of forgiveness, and consider their willingness and capacity to heal as a family. Aside from that, Your Honor, Despite the difficultness of this case, Justin made my job easy. He did all the work, the counseling, setbacks, the growth, more setbacks, the accountability, the programming, the growth, more setbacks, the relationship building, Justin did that. Not me, Justin. My job is simply to show this court the work that Justin did. Justin is a true example of what happens when an individual is bound and determined to use every resource they have to better themselves. 
Justin is proof that even an imperfect system full of imperfect individuals can work to benefit our imperfect world. Today, Your Honor, we humbly request that after consideration of court rulings in Stovall and Miller, consideration of the Miller factors, the acknowledgement of Justin's path to accountability and rehabilitation, that this court in its wisdom will find that there's a substantial and compelling reason for a downward deviation from the minimum guidelines that were previously determined to be 270 to 450 months. And we ask that you sentence Justin to a term of years not to exceed 279 months and grant his immediate release. So the offense took place in June of 2000. I think I mistakenly said November earlier, based off of a newspaper article. And in December of 2000, he was sentenced to life in prison. I believe in the sentence it said with the possibility of parole, but I'm not positive. So with the resentencing, it has to be a number of years specifically. The prosecution is asking for 360 months, which would equal 30 years, which would mean he would serve seven more years. The defense team is asking that he be released immediately and just be given time served. Personally, the one thing I found interesting was when the prosecution said that he hasn't had access to a lot of the court services that are considered rehabilitation services because he was serving a term of life, which why the services are there. He's there. Let him do them. Why? Why would you not let him do those? That's I don't understand that. That really bothers me. All right. So, Mr. Gibson, yes, you can stand at the podium next to your attorney. Is there anything you'd like to say on your own behalf before the court? Uh, yes, ma'am. I think about grandma every day. The decision I made to take her life, to take her away from everyone, all the pain the heartache, the emotional trauma I have inflicted on so many. Grandma loved unconditionally. She loved, cared, and fought for me. I'm so ashamed that I took her love away from others. I am ashamed that I was loved. I did not know how to love or what it was. The impact of taking grandma's life is devastating. I think a grandpa losing the love of his life the time they shared together, bonded with love and family and friends, then betrayed by me. His world upended, his love gone. The emotional and mental trauma I have caused, the loss, the sadness, the void I created in his life. On Connie and Uncle Steve, mom, the pain they have felt from losing their mother, the love and nurturing now gone, the anger, the tears wept. I am the cause of unimaginable heartbreak. I'm bothered by the knowing I have caused so much pain to so many family, friends, and neighbors. Amber, Hannah, Charlie, and Luke, my cousins. My grandma will not see how you have grown. I took away the opportunity to create so many happy memories with her. I wish I could give you mine. I took away so much. My sisters, Heather, Betty, Elizabeth, the reach of the pain I have caused and traveled farther than I can ever imagine. Family, friends, neighbors, the community, the officers and prosecutors who have worked on this case. I'm ashamed of what I have done. I'm ashamed of the negative impact I have had on so many. I would not be here today if not for forgiveness. It has been the forgiveness of my mom and sisters that have taught me to forgive myself. I hated myself for so long, yet they continue to love me. It has been their mental and emotional support that has helped me develop the new I am today. While living with my grandparents, I felt alone. My father had just kicked me out. Uncle Steve would not speak or look at me, and Uncle Connie did not want me around. 
I began isolating myself whenever they came to the house. I would go outside and hide until they left. I felt unwanted and that I did not belong. It was these feelings that drove me to want to run away. I know now how wrong I was about the events of me being moved around. I know now how emotionally inept I was. Sadness and depression without the ability to identify those feelings or a healthy way of coping or expressing them. I learned early in life to suppress emotions. When being punished by my stepfather, the more I cried or struggled, the longer or more severe the punishment became. I became conditioned not to struggle and not to cry. I became emotionless, numb. The only emotion I expressed was anger, all in unhealthy ways. While sitting in my cell at Marie Spear campus, I was crying. I asked by a staff member why I was crying. I told him because I had killed my grandma. He told me I was only crying because I got caught. This just reaffirmed my distorted thinking that showing emotions is bad. Sadness is a feeling to be suppressed. I then spent a little over a decade in prison, self-medicating to avoid shame, sadness, and depression. I finally reached my bottom in 2010. At that time, I was back in level four, drinking heavily and taking prescription medication. Much of 2010 to 2012 is a blur. Except for when I began to question myself, what is it I want in life? What am I doing? How am I gonna get there? I would call and talk to Grandma Mary twice a month. Then one day I was told she was being placed in hospice. I called again and was able to talk to her one last time. Her husband said she woke up and I was able to talk to her. The next day she passed away. I broke. It was as if all the sadness in me was spilling out. I cried drunkenly for most of the night. When I got up the next morning and looked at myself, I knew that I needed to make a change. I was not sure of what, but I could not continue with the same habits, same friends, and expect my life to change. In my moment of grief, I had another sobering realization. All that sadness and pain I felt, I'm the cause of those same feelings and so many others. Never again do I want to be the reason people feel those emotions. In early 2013, I was moved to Kinross. Here I was tapped to help the NLA and Natalie develop a self-help program for lifers to better prepare us for the parole board. Honestly, I knew nothing, little. I was more student giving feedback. Amazingly for me, it was this program and being part of facilitating that was more therapy for me. The emotional develop has been the most instrumental Without the personal enrichment and parole writer in this program, I don't know where I would be. I was able to truly find happiness. That despite being incarcerated, I was happy. I was allowed to be happy. I discovered that the one true control I have is over myself. So I concentrate on me, what I do to control my feelings and how I respond to them. I treat everyone with respect and dignity because it is right, and that is how I want to be treated. I'm not invaluable. I spent so long with the belief I could earn a parole, and that belief had yet to be challenged. On my 20-year life of review, I was told I could not earn a parole. That was difficult to process. Then COVID hit the compound. I watched as friends and peers became devastatingly ill, being taken away in ambulances, some passing away. It was a very helpless time with loss and grief. I fell back to my old coping mechanism, drinking. The significant difference was I knew I was grieving. I knew I was self-medicating. Hope found, hope lost, happiness found, happiness lost. It was an experience I needed. Life will not always be full of joy and happiness. Without having gone through that loss of hope and loss of happiness, I would not have discovered I am capable and in control of how I respond to my feelings. I found that I have family and friends that I can share my struggles with. I had discovered it's more productive to talk about negative feelings rather than dwell and languish in them. With sobriety comes clarity. I share this newfound sobriety with Jacqueline, who I talk to often. 
We both are in this place that the desire to drink is not there. Although I know that if the desire does come, I have family and friends to talk to. I give power to my emotions and I choose to give power to the love and happiness. With love and happiness that brings me to mom and my sisters. I have watched my sisters as they have grown to become beautiful independent women you are today. With two nieces, Alexis and Ziva, two nephews, Carter and Wyatt, with one on the way. Our relationships have grown stronger over the years, and I'm truly a lucky brother and look forward to the future as an active uncle. Mom, I saved to talk about you for last. Without you, none of this would be possible. You have experienced so much heartache that I am directly responsible for. Through it all, you continue to love me, even when I did not love myself. I felt undeserving of love, so you did not give up on me. It was your unconditional love and forgiveness that has shown me how to love and forgive myself. The future is unwritten. The one thing that has remained constant is that how I treat and interact with others. Everyone is entitled to dignity and respect. I know I am not alone. In this journey, and I'm excited about what the future holds. And I thank you for the opportunity. And I thank my family for being here today. Ms. Kennegan or Ms. Bregman, anything further? Your Honor, I would just note that the individual that Justin, that Justin spoke of, Jacqueline, who has supported him in learning how to cope with sobriety, is very important today, supporting him as well, and it tends to be a constant in his life. Okay. And Ms. Bregman, as always, you both always write wonderful briefs, but um, I probably will repeat a lot of your brief just because I, I like the format. And so I will use part of that as the process I go through because this does require a lot of important things to be placed on the record. And um, so what was the set original sentencing date on this, Mr. Moore? Was October 27th. No, December 27th. December 27th, 2000. 2000? 2000. 2000? That's correct. December 27th, 2000. All right. So defendant was charged with um, multiple counts in 2000. Homicide, open murder, count two, assault with intent, rabble armed, count three, carrying with unlawful intent, count four, felony firearm, and count five, homicide, murder, second degree, which I assume was added for the purposes of a plea at that time. The other counts were dismissed, and on December 27th of 2000, he was sentenced to life with the possibility of parole. On July 28th of 2022, the Michigan Supreme Court in People v. Stovall 510 Mish 301 held in part that defendants, a defendant's life sentence with the possibility of parole for second degree murder imposed for a crime committed when he was in juvenile, one of juvenile, violated Article 1, 16, and Section 16 of the Michigan Constitution, prohibiting cruel or unusual punishment. The court vacated defendant's sentence in that case and remanded to the circuit court for sentencing. Um, and that's why we are here today. Defendant at the age of 15 deliberately claimed to kill both his grandmother and grandfather, Betty and Richard Myers. He resided with his grandparents who had cared for him on and off throughout his life. The original PSI dated December 26 of 2000 detailed the voluntary account from the defendant after being taken into custody. I hope the court does know he was 15 at that time. On June 30th, while both of his grandparents were out of the house, he had dug a hole in the backyard of his home with his grandfather's backhoe, practiced shooting the 22 caliber rifle, when his grandmother returned home, he shot her, then dragged her and put her in the bucket of the back hall, making sure to lift it up to hide her from view. He left, he went with a friend to the mall. Um, he returned home, took the gun outside and lied in wait for his grandfather to return. Um, he did not, even though he had planned to shoot his grandfather at that time. The rest of the day, he hid on, in different areas on the property, waiting for the police to arrive. He saw his grandfather and heard his grandfather find his grandmother's body. 
He admitted to taking money, an ATM card, credit card, and a key from his grandmother's purse. At the time, at the age of 15, he stated the reason he wanted to kill his grandparents was because they lectured him. It's 20, almost 25 years later, we do recognize um, he was at the age of 15 at the time of his and those statements were made. His grandfather, Richard Myers, did speak at the original sentencing, and um, that is included in a transcript as well as part of Ms. Bregman's pleadings and acknowledged by Ms. Hennigan in her pleadings. The rest of his family is here today with the benefit of 20 years or more passing since that time. And I'm sure that they have moved through stages of grief, anger, loss, and it appears they have now reached a stage of forgiveness. Unfortunately, his grandfather is no longer alive. So I don't know what he would have said if he had appeared today. He may have reached a stage of forgiveness, he may not. Have. But the court does take into consideration the statement he made at that time. It's clear that at that time, Mr. Myers had suffered a severe and intense psychological harm. The defendant is entitled to resentencing today under the rationale of Stovall, which held that a sentence of parolable life imprisonment for a juvenile convicted of secondary degree murder is unusually excessive and violates the cruel or unusual punishment um, which is prohibited by the Michigan Constitution. In coming to this conclusion, the Stovall Court rationalized that a life sentence with possibility of parole imposed on a defendant who is a juvenile at the time of the offense for second degree murder, as in this case, violated the Michigan's Constitution, its prohib prohibition on cruel or unusual punishment. And that sentence was the most severe possible penalty for second degree murder, more severe than a 25 to 40 minimum sentence imposed on juveniles who commit first degree murder. At the same time as Stovall, the Michigan Supreme Court also decided people be Boykin, 510 Mich 171, that is a Michigan 2002 case, 22 case. Boykin dealt with a first degree murder case, but the case discussed the sentencing court's obligation when sentencing a youthful offender to a term of years. The Boykin court held sentencing courts must consider youth as a mitigating factor at sentencing hearings conducted under MCL 769.25 or MCL 769.25A when the defendant is sentenced to a term of years. However, the court's consideration of youth need not be articulated on the record. Therefore, the Court of Appeals was correct when it held that there is no constitutional mandate to make specific findings on the record as to the Miller factors, but that sentencing court should be guided by the snow factors, which necessarily include consideration of youth as a mitigating factor. Wines um, 323 Mish Abbott 352. People be Boykin 510 Mish at 196. Although the defendant in this case addresses the Miller factors in his mitigation and resentencing memo, memo MCL 769.25 and 769.25A only apply to cases in which the prosecutor seeks a life without parole sentence, which is not the case here. That said, and I agree with Ms. Bregman on this, there have been few cases interpreting Stovall, and it is unclear at this time if the reviewing courts will require the trial court to also consider the Miller factors in second degree murder cases. This very concern was raised by Justice Boonstra in his concurring opinion in the unpublished case, People v. Abitoy, issued August 18th of 2022. The Supreme Court in Boykin stated that sentencing juvenile defendants who were convicted of first degree murder is an exceptionally daunting task for trial courts. I would further add, sentencing any juvenile on adult offense is daunting. Post Boykin, post Boykin, the task is even more exceptionally daunting as trial courts will be obliged to grapple with Boykin's self contradictory descriptions of what trial courts are and are not obliged to do. Out of abundance of caution, I will, as Ms. Bruggeman recommends, even though it's not required anywhere in case law or statute, today this court will address on the record not only the snow factors, but the Miller factors and the mitigating factor of youth in general when I fashion this sentence. Sentences imposed are to be proportionate 
to the seriousness of the circumstances surrounding the offense and the offender will be no more 435-30, because the Supreme Court has held that youth, a circumstance of the offender, matters at sentencing, youth does affect the court's interpretation of the snow factors. In snow, the Michigan Supreme Court directed a sentencing court to consider the following objectives, the reformation of the offender, the protection of society, the disciplining of the wrongdoer, the deterrence of others from committing like offenses, Snow 386 Mish at 592. In Boykin, the Supreme Court explained how youth affects the sentencing court's consideration of the snow factors. Thus, when deciding the minimum term range for a defendant's term of year sentence, the court is required to consider the snow objectives and the mitigating factors of the defendant's youth at the time of the offense. Um, as noted um, by both counsel under the snow factors, the defendant's attorney at the time, so I'm trying to figure out was either John Glazier, but then um, Donald <coughs> Callahan? That was the sentencing or appellate. Oh, okay. I believe it was Mr. Baker. Oh, Mr. John Baker. Mr. Mr. Glazier was his attorney. Mr. Baker appeared on his behalf at sentencing. Okay. Um, he did address the defendant's youthfulness um, in, at the time of sentencing. Taking into account the mitigating factor of youth, the prosecutor has recommended and stated correctly that it's necessary to also look at his institutional record when looking at his defend the defendant's character and potential for rehabilitation, disciplining of the wrongdoer as well as concerns for the protection of society and deterrence. According to the misconduct summary report attached to the updated free sentence report, um, he has had um, his most recent misconduct was July 26th of 2022. According to the updated PSI and verified by his prison record, he has committed at least 22 misconducts while incarcerated over the past 23 years. I agree that this is not an astronomical number in the prison world. Um, and a third of them have appeared in the last few years, but Ms. Hennigan, as well as Mr. Gibson, has addressed both his mindset and the factors that contributed to what he believes caused him to commit those misconducts. Um, defendant has been reviewed by um, the parole board three times, 2010, 2015 and 2020, with the majority of the members voting no interest each time. I believe his next review will be July 1 of 2025. He hasn't as of yet received a public hearing and he was denied commutation or pardon from the governor back in 2008. He has received his GAD. He has engaged in various um, positive programming and it appears everything that he was capable of being involved in, he has been involved in. Most notably working on reentry programs as well as dog training. Um, he has developed as an adult substance abuse problem in the Michigan Department of Corrections. And um, many of those misconducts um, seem to be um, related to that. He does um, accept responsibility and express remorse. Um, it's evident from his statement today. Also the description of his family's interactions with him over the last 20 plus years. And while the prosecutor makes special note of the fact that his description of the events has changed from what he said over 20 years ago, I don't think that is entirely unusual when time passes. I see victims and defendant stories change over time, um, maturity, age, life experiences, lack of memory, changes in memory can contribute to that. Um, the defendant definitely did express remorse today and in fact, I, so I do acknowledge that his statement at the time of the offense at the age of 15 to the police officers in the probation department is somewhat different than his description given both through counseling and to the parole board. I contributed most of that to time passing and maturity. I agree with the prosecutor that um, while 
We don't know if we have to address the Miller factors because this is so new. I agree that it, it is important that we do so when fashioning this offense. The Miller mitigating factors are as follows. His chronological age and its hallmark features, among them immaturity, impetuosity, and failure to appreciate risks and consequences to the family home and environment that surrounded him and surrounds him from which he cannot usually extricate himself, no matter how brutal or dysfunctional. The circumstance number three, the circumstances of the homicide offense, including the extent of his participation in the conduct and the way familial or peer pressures may have affected him. Number four, whether he might have been charged with and convicted of a lesser offense, if not for incompetencies associated with use, youth. For example, his inability to deal with police officers or prosecutors, including on a plea agreement, or his incapacity to assist his own attorneys. And five, the possibility of rehabilitation. People be Skinner, 502 Michigan, citing Miller 567 U.S. at 477-478. Addressing number one, his chronological age and its hallmark features, among them immaturity, impetuosity, and failure to appreciate risks and consequences. There is no doubt that the defendant was young when he murdered his grandmother. The prosecutor argues that he was not naive to the criminal justice system and has already racked up adjudications for retail fraud third, unlawful driving away of an automotive vehicle, domestic violence, largely less than 200, unarmed robbery, and another UDAA. Um, defendant at that time clearly had an issue with authority and impulsivity and failed um, to take into consideration the gravity of his actions. However, as indicated before or and above in the prosecutor's um, statement, defendant continued to commit misconducts in prison, demonstrating that he does not have control over his impulsive behaviors. Psychology, uh, therapy, counseling studies now show that the male, but the teen brain continues to develop until the late 20s. One of the things um, that continues to develop is the prefrontal cortex, which is one of the last things that mature or finish growing in young adult pet would. It's clear that mental illness was present um, we talk, there was some discussion today between his family himself, Ms. Hennigan, anxiety, depression, um, abuse, and neglect, not in his grandparents' home, but in his prior home based on statements made about his stepfather as well as neglect by his um, biological father. So the court does find that impulsivity at that age, along with an issue with authority, would be common and not out of the ordinary. The ability to look at um, and take into account the end result or the gravity of his actions also is not uncommon at that age, but I do not find the level of misconducts that he had in prison to be or out of the ordinary excessive. Number two, the family and home environment that surrounds him and from which he cannot usually extricate himself no matter how brutal or dysfunctional. The defendant did um, in his statement state that he had a very good relationship with his grandparents, but there is evidence both by statements made by his family members and also himself that um, his home life outside of his grandparents' home, there was psychological, physical abuse that was taking place. I mean, it's very clear not by his biological mother or his mother, but by his stepfather, lack of, um, by his biological father. Um, his grandparents provided a safe, loving home for him because his mother was working, trying to support the family, but his behavior is based on what came before that. So I do find that he was in an environment before his grandparents that did have abuse 
Number three, the circumstances of the home homicide offense, including the extent of its participation in the conduct and the way familial or peer pressures may have affected him. Defendant on his own accord um, did, without the help of anyone, plot to kill both of his grand grandparents. Nobody asked him to do it. No one helped him to do it. So I don't find that there was any um, peer pressure or um, family pressure to commit these offenses. He carried them out on his own. But I do find that the abuse and neglect he had exposed, been exposed to could have impacted, would have most likely impacted his behavior at this time, as well as his prior juvenile record. Number four, whether he might have been charged with and convicted of a lesser offense, um, if not the com incompetencies associated with you, the court agrees that there is no evidence from the record um, that one, he would have been charged with a lesser offense because he was charged with homicide over murder and he pled to a lesser offense. But the court also finds that there's no evidence that he was unable to participate in discussions with his attorney or didn't understand the proceedings in any way. Number five, the possibility of rehabilitation. Parties all agree that he has completed programming um, available to him successfully. And while that does not mean that he has been fully rehabilitated, it does mean that he has made an effort to better himself. Today, as well as in his statements to family as expressed by that family today, he has expressed remorse for what he did. Um, and he also did acknowledge that there was abuse with his father and stepfather and his upbringing with them, he believes, turned him into the 15-year-old child that would do this. He did have a psychological evaluation in 2020. And the psychologist at that time stated he doesn't appear to present with empathy or regret. He shows no emotion when answering the questions and stated his answers in a matter-of-fact way. When asked about his grandfather, he said he wrote him a letter years ago and he gave it to his mom that his grandfather would take it. And then he died. Um, a 15-year-old child to the man he is today, a lot of time has passed. Um, he has dealt with it. Um, he's had to tell this story over and over when dealing with counselors and psychologists and parole boards. And I don't find that this is enough to determine that he has not taken advantage of rehabilitation available to him. The defendant in this case is asking for immediate release. The prosecutor you know, finds this inappropriate when you take into account the above factors and the gravity of this crime and the psychological evaluation. He has struggled intermittently with substance abuse. And I know it exists, but I always am a little taken aback when you hear about people struggling with substance abuse in the Michigan Department of Corrections, but it exists. It's not allowed. You know, we know alcohol and substance abuse is not allowed in the Michigan Department of Corrections, but we do know where there's a will, there's a way. So, Determining the appropriate sentence in this case, the court has considered the seriousness of the offense, your history, the principle of proportionality, the statutory penalty, the cost of confinement, the sentencing guidelines, the report and recommendation of the probation department, as well as what has been set upon the record at this hearing. The criteria and the reasons for the sentence are the nature and gravity of the offenses, the offense, the discipline appropriate to its commission, deterrence against repetition by you and by others, the potential for reformation, vindication for the law and the protection of society. The recommendation in the updated report is for the defendant to serve 450 to 720 months is served at this point. We served about we 
served 8,382 days at this point, which is about 279 months since Robert. The recommendation, as I said, by both the prosecutor and um, the public or probation department is for a sentence of 450 months to 720 months. This court, while I do not agree that um, sentencing under the guidelines would be appropriate in this case, based on the nature and the gravity of this offense, I do feel that um, Mr. Gibson, under those mitigating factors, has made progress and worked hard as the support of his family. Um, he has maintained connections with them. Um, at the time he does get released, he will have those support in place um, as he continues his life. So, sentence of the court that you will serve 290 months to 400 or I'm sorry 290 months to 720 months with the Michigan Department of Corrections. I do this because you have made efforts. You have gained the forgiveness of your family. I believe you have a support system in place, but I also can tell you it's not going to be an easy transition. You have spent the formative years of your life in the Michigan Department of Corrections. I do believe that they have worked hard to provide services as allowed and provided with funding from the state of Michigan to you, but it is a process. I still doesn't mean the parole board is going to release you. I have no control or authority over that. So um, I will give you credit for 8,382 days served. Judge, I apologize. You had 178 already credit in December of 2000. Well, I'm hoping the 8,382 days would be part of that, Mr. Moore. Correct. That was added on February 22nd of 23. He served 22 years, seven months, 11 days. And I added on the days uh, from there and came up with the 8,382 days. Um, time computation will correct if there's any issues with that, but it should be accurate. Is that good, Miss Adams? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right. Um, there's still a $130 crime victim right fee, $68 in state costs, $60 DNA fee. I'm assuming that's already been paid. You, no, I don't know. So. I do have to order that. Um, that could be a condition of parole at any time you get parole, but I think you're working at the prison. So I need to take it out of that. I probably already did that. Anything else, Mr. Moore? No, Your Honor. Um, if um, Back when he was sentenced in 2000, there was no DNA fee, so I don't know if we need to add that now or not. No, I guess we strike that, no DNA fee. Okay. Mr. Gibson and Mr. Gibson's family, I will tell you, but for you appearing today and your statements today and the fact that you will provide support for him and also your statements today, I probably would have sentenced you to the recommendation because most of the time there are people showing up in the courtroom. This is a difficult case. I appreciate everybody's hard work on it. Do we have appellate paperwork, Ms. Adams? I believe it was in the file, Judge. All right, so my bailiff's gonna hand down to your notice of right to appellate review. I'm gonna ask that you initial and date the first copy, just to acknowledge and receive the paperwork that's gonna go in my file. The other copies are for you. If you wish to appeal your sentence, you can fill out the information on the form and mail it to the court within 42 days at the address listed on the form. Gibson, I do wish you the best of luck and the record should reflect I received back a signed copy of the notice of right to appellate review. Thank you. And Ms. Bergman and Ms. Hennigan, if I can have five minutes of your time. Two minutes, baby.